have a joint meetup with us beyond rails so welcome to everyone from the rails group and uh, we're gonna get started just some few slides so sb agile we started this more than 17 meetups ago <laughs> try to create a community in santa barbara where people talk and share all things agile and just give people another chance to make friends in santa barbara we're affiliated with the Agile Alliance and Scrum Alliance. We're actually in the presence of an Agile Alliance board member, who is Olaf right here, who will be speaking with us today. So you can ask him all about that. And thanks to our sponsors, Citrix and Appfolio, for supporting our meetups uh, in this event in particular. This is awkward because I'm the speaker next month. Oh. So <laughs> this is, uh, there, uh, yeah. Gonna be talking about the history of Agile at at Folio, we've been doing Agile software development for eight years. We didn't call it Agile in the beginning. It was, I guess, XP and Scrum's uh, where our roots are. So I'm going to talk about that next month. It's a presentation that I gave at the Agile Minds convention recently in August of this year. And I'm really happy to introduce our speaker for this evening, Ola Amnestam. He's here from Stockholm, Sweden. Like I said, a board member of the Agile Alliance. He's been a technical consultant for many years. His company in Sweden is called Agical. And he's going to uh, talk with us today about an exper some experiences and share some stories that he's had working at uh, on a longer term engagement with a client uh, at a bank in Sweden. And also he's the co-author of the Mikado Method, which is an approach to refactoring. So I'll have this copy up here, I encourage you to ask him questions about this as well. And yeah, so without further ado, here's Olaf. Yes. Thanks, Heidi. <laughs> yeah, so thanks so much for having me and uh, an extra big special thank you to Heidi for inviting me to this. Uh, I'm going to be talking about what I call contiguous improvement over continuous delivery. It's sort of a, uh, our way of doing uh, DevOps or something that we call something else. Um, a little bit about my situation. I, I'm at this long-term engagement with this small bank. It's a small Scandinavian bank. Uh, there's business in uh, Norway, uh, Sweden, and Finland. Uh, the, the business model is really simple. It's as simple as it is profitable. It's consumer loans and savings on the web. So that means that there's no bank that you can walk into. I haven't seen one single coin or, or bill <laughs> in the whole time. It's actually just virtual money. The money that I'm looking at from on a day-to-day -day basis is, uh, it's in a file. <laughs> I mean, I could replace a number with some other number and that, people ho that person holding that account would get a real <laughs> surprise. <laughs> so I, it's uh, sort of kind of, it's not tempting to think about it, but it's, uh, it's, it's different. So it's only savings and loans on the web. And, and in order for you to understand how, what we're going through, because I'm going to tell you what, ab about my journey here and about, about the, sort of the values that we live under or by, um, going to give you sort of a, tell you about the technical environment. There's this customer web. And there's, in the middle of all this, there's a database where, where everything, where the money is stored, basically. And there's an app back office system. And there's also a report server that produces reports and a batch server that runs batches that integrates with the rest of the world. And in the banking world, there are files, 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 and endless amounts of files that keep sending. The money comes in in files. We keep sending invoices in files, and it's files everywhere. So that's, that's what we produce, pretty much. But it wasn't always like this. A long time ago, 
like seven or eight years ago, all the services were at the, on the same computer. The report server, the batch server, the back office system, but not the customer web because that was uh, outside uh, of the, the internet, so to speak. So when a, when, a, when a credit manager or account manager were to run a report, they could like s slow down the whole system. Uh, and then before I came on, they fixed that. But there's this other thing that they haven't, we haven't been able to fix just yet. It's nowhere in the system is the balance of an account or the, the, the balance of a loan stored, which in retrospect was a really stupid decision. Because when the bank is young uh, and there are, aren't that many accounts, you can sort of compute the balance really fast. But after a while, when people withdraw money and deposit money and pay off their loans, it, get, it gets very sluggish. So uh, there's, there was this report when I came on. It took two and a half hours to run that. Uh, a year later, it had doubled, like five, five hours. And a year later, we were looking at like eight or nine hours. And this report, they need <coughs> once a day, they need that report for Sweden, Finland, and Norway. And three times nine doesn't fit in a day. So we were looking at ser some serious trouble. So we knew that we had to sort of handle this in way, one way or the other. So we were starting to look at the system. I'm going to use a metaphor here. As there's this, in the tropics, there's this, um, strangler fig or a tree that grows, uh, has a gr strangling growth habit. It has its, its host tree and it sends down the vines on the host tree and it creates sort of a column tree around that, the host tree. So it strangles the host tree and sometimes the host tree dies and sometimes the, the host tree lives and, and the, the vine, the strangler fig, continues to live as well. And we like to see the, the old system, which is uh, based on, on an object relational model, which is very slow for this. We like to see that as the, the host tree. And around that system, we create our new system. So we, we get the supporting structure from the old system, and we keep on delivering new features every day. So we have this legacy code base, and we have a lot of new features that we want to get out to our customers. And that's the, the, the whole struggle, what we're competing against. So, and in order to, to do this, we need, um, we need to behave. We need a set of values that supports uh, this. So I came along in 2010. And this, this, I'm going to tell you uh, 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 some stories. And <clears throat> it's going to be sort of a, a timeline. I'm going back and forth here between 2010 and 2013, 14. So I, was, I came along in 2010. I would call that, that is sort of the drop when I dropped, was dropped into the situation. And then we have the moving in phase. And now we're at sort of the in the end zone. For you sports nuts, the end zone means this is where you score. Um, <clears throat> so a friend of mine, he called me up and he said, Ola, the, the consultants, uh, they're leaving. And uh, do you want a new gig? And I said, what's it like? And he told me about that situation. I was like, okay. And I was sort of dropped in that team. <clears throat> <clears throat> so we're a team of 12. And some of you might think, oh yeah, 12 developers for a, for a bank, that's not a lot. But you're wrong. <clears throat> We're a team of 12, including the account managers and the customer support and the developers. So when I joined, it was just me. And then two more developers joined. So now we're, by the way, I'm, I'm the one down on the <laughs> right there. 
So the team consists of um, developers and operations, DevOps. We develop our own code and we, we sort of, yeah, we put it in production and do all that stuff. The, from the sort of the, the hardware up, we're responsible or the, more like the operating system and up. We have credit managers, account managers, and customer support. And we like to think that we are all experts, pretty much, or, or very, or at least really, really good. Um, but we like to think, we don't see these as roles. It's more like activities. We do development, we do operations. I think I could probably pay out a loan. It might default earlier than, than the others, but <laughs> I think I could. Uh, the product owner, he's pretty tech savvy. He knows how to handle uh, very simple SQL commands. He can pull out a report if he wants one. And so we're really a very cross-functional team. And I think that's really key to our situation here. We, we, want, we want that, otherwise we can't, we, can't be, we can't do the business that we like. So, in order to, to get this, um, in order to run this operation, the bank, we rest upon three core values, or uh, yeah, we like to call them values. It's, it's minimalism, and for you in the back, it's, it's, it's minimalism. <laughs> uh, I tried to, to like type that really, really tiny, but then I like people like, oh, make it bigger. So we're resting on minimalism, pragmatism, and holism. We do a minimum amount to get a new feature into production. We are very pragmatic on how we do things. We're not married to a technical solution. We make sure that it solves our business problem. But minimalism with pragmatism wouldn't be anything without holism. If we're only doing the, the sort of the minimalistic approach and the pragmatic approach, you get duct taping. You do only the, the, the least possible thing to fix a leaky roof. You put a bucket on the floor. Or, or you keep putting duct tape over a hole in a, in a boat or something. You, you can get away with that for quite some time. But when your boat is only like 100% duct tape, that, that would never happen, right? But, but with, a, with a computer or, or software, I see software that is pretty much like 101% duct tape, which is only possible in the software world. If you're only doing the, the minimalistic and holistic approach, you're, you're doing a sort of a spike solution or a, or a prototype. You're driving something through the whole system. You can see that it works, but it's really minimalistic. It, it might not work in production. And if you're having, doing the sort of the pragmatic and holistic approach, you get, get what I call a Swiss Army chainsaw. It's not a Swiss Army knife, it's a chainsaw. It does everything, it's big. And, and when we develop stuff, we can't have big software. We, can't have, we don't want complex solution. We want to minimize, minimize it. And if you're doing it this way, you're getting the real speed out of Agile. So I've put together this sort of mnemonic for you here. MPH, the Minimalistic, Pragmatic, Holistic Approach. We, we don't do, when I say we get the real speed, we get the business agility out of, uh, of software development. We're so small that we can change our mind fast. We can put it into production really fast, but we still see the whole problem, the holistic approach. 
we're not sprinting. We're not doing two weeks or four week sprints. We're doing one small piece at a time and delivering only that piece. In fact, when we sort of stand in front of a, a decision and sort of we want to know if, if we're going ahead with this, uh, my boss, uh, the product owner, the sort of the, the domain expert, he whips out his old HP calculator. I bet you've seen this. I tried to, to draw it, but it's, it's this big. And he carries it around at times, at all times. And if you want to sort of play a, sort of have some fun with him, you, when he looks away, you, you like put, hide it. <laughs> and 10 minutes later, he'll be running around looking for that calculator. It's so important. It's so important that we, at one time, we were doing some work with the, with the, the, the Finnish, the Finns. And, um, we were doing a change to, to the reminders of uh, the invoicing for, for the loans. And um, this was a Friday, and we were discussing, are, are we going live with this? Or, or maybe we can put this, uh, go live on Mondays, on, on Monday instead. So when he said, oh, OK, so Ola, well, we, d we don't have unit tests for pretty much, we have some unit tests for the code base, but the, the guys, before us, they, they didn't write unit tests. We have pretty much no integration tests. So when we do something, we have to be super careful because we don't want to break the invoicing. And most of all, we don't want to break the savings. I mean, savings is, is the sort of the, what, the big pile of money that we stand on. It's the money that we, we lend, lend out. Don't want to pull the rug under our, our feet. So, but we were discussing this uh, this feature for the Finns, and and he and I uh, and he asked me, so what's the backup plan? Okay, well we can do this, we can do that, but we don't know. We don't want to set. Uh, we don't want to break anything else or or the invoicing. So, and the invoice. So, and he said, okay, he whipped out his com calculator and did some some computations, and I don't remember exactly how much it was, but it was sort of in the range, like I th think it was 20,000 euros. So if we go live today, we save this much money, we can make this much money. But if we go live Monday, so we decided that we go live Monday. It wasn't that much money, not for the bank. In the beginning though, we didn't, we couldn't, conversations like these, uh, wasn't easy to have because we sat three floors apart. Three floors apart is where you think, mm, well, uh, I don't want to pick up that phone. It's, it's too hard. Or I don't want to send that email. I'll, I'll just code away a bit. Or, or the business person like, oh, I don't want to disturb the developers. Maybe they're thinking about something really important. So we set three floors apart. Things are going to change, though. And in 2010, we had a really crappy way of deploying to production. We had a 10, it was more than 10 steps to build the software and to deploy it. And you can imagine how many times that fails. I mean, today, as you can see, we introduced in 2013 a three-step deploy, but the way there went through what I call, we needed a pure build. We had this, there's this concept in functional programming. You have a pure function. If you have a, a parameter or, or a variable, something that goes into a function, and every time you run that function, it returns the same results. That's a pure function as opposed to a function with a mutable state where you do something and then you return, you call that function with the same parameters and get different results. That's, that's an impure function. And very much like that, we had an impure build. I was doing something, uh, deploying to production, 
and I was really surprised because it didn't get the sort of the effect that I was looking for. So I, I deployed again. I was like, nope. And uh, so I just cleaned everything on the, the production server, the whole directory. And I deployed again. Oh, now it, it works. But then three days later, we get a crash in the system. And it turns out that there was files there in the production environment that I didn't know existed. So we were going, I was chasing ghosts. Uh, so that, uh, then I decided we want a pure build so we know what's on that server in production. And I, we also learned that we want to be able to revert, revert very fast. If we deploy something that isn't working, we want to go back really fast. And that took us the better part of a year to accomplish. And in between that, we added some integration tests to the system. So we have the single artifact release. We went from subversion to Git. And now we were starting to talk about what we call error surface. If we have a very mm, severe, if we have two axes, uh, one is time and one is severe, severity, severity uh, you can have a very severe error, something that is in production that causes you trouble. And it can be in production for a certain amount of time. You get, a, you get sort of the error surface. If we have a not so severe problem, but it's in production for a long, longer time, time period, you get the same error surface. So we introduced this concept that we talk about error surface, and we want to reduce that error surface. We don't want any error surface at all. And we realized that the key to reducing error surface, which is sort of counterintuitive, is to be able to roll back really fast. Most people, they attack from the left. They try to do the, the, the right thing. But we realized that doing the right thing is kind of hard if we have a system that we don't know where the parts are moving because we didn't, we didn't have unit tests for the whole system. We didn't have integration tests. So we invested a lot in what I call an undo strategy. You know, in, in Word, when you type and you want to undo something, you press Control c right? We wanted that for our production environment. So we invested heavily in our Control z strategy to reduce the error surface. So we have the single artifact release. We moved from SVN to Git. Oh, sorry. And that, for us, is sort of focusing on, on a minimal of what we can do, try to accomplish. Another thing that I think is very telling on how we work, try to reduce the amount of work done, is uh, how we handle uh, race conditions or how the, the count managers and the um, credit managers work with the system. We don't have a complex locking uh, mechanism. So we, if someone goes into a view and edits a, a customer, and someone enters the same view and the same customer, they ed edit, edit something, save that, and go back. And then the first person saves it again. It gets overwritten. And you think that that might be a stupid idea, and it might in your situation, but for us, we use conversation. We talk to uh, each other and say, OK, so I'm in this part now, doing, working with this customer. So please stay out of there, which has saved us a lot of complexity in the code. I mean, loads of complexity. 
So 2010, we sat three floors apart. And if that wasn't bad enough, some stupid manager decided that we can't be in the same building. So they moved us three blocks apart. And that was probably the worst nine months or, or a year. I don't remember how long we sat there. But if it was hard to pick up a phone, it's even harder to, to go walk three blocks. So I think I saw my, my boss three times. We had to schedule meetings. And he didn't want to disturb us. And we don't, didn't want to disturb him. So we had to schedule meetings and, and things. At one time, I think we worked on, uh, on a particular piece of code for a couple of months before we realized that mm, we didn't get this right from the beginning. And he was upset, and we were upset. So back in 2010, this is what continuous deployment looked like. We scheduled a date. We had to schedule a date because we didn't know when they were using the system. We couldn't, we couldn't know if, if it, is, it, is it a good time now to, to deploy new software. Uh, <clears throat> then, during the sort of the, the moving in phase, there was this, I remember this meeting clearly. Uh, <clears throat> it had to do with, we were developing this new functionality or thinking about developing new functionality for debt collection. So debt collection, if you, if you don't pay your loan, the bank will, they want their money. You're not getting away with that, oh no, I don't feel like paying today. So they, they want your money. So debt collection, collection is, will be a big thing. The first, one, the first year, probably there's not that many loans that, but the second year and the third year, and, and in 2011, the debt collection was handled manually, and it took them the better part of a day to handle that, which is very boring, repetitive, Thus, it becomes very error prone. So we were sitting down, the whole team, the 12 of us, having a discussion on how to make this, the, the credit managers more happy. And we were struggling for an hour, I think, um, trying to come up with a, how to imitate their, sort of the, the manual process. And then someone got this, really wacky idea that we, well, we maybe, maybe we don't need to imitate the manual process. Maybe we can do something else. We're sort of doing a new process here. We can do it in another way. So we came up with this idea that we could, uh, could we, we, need, we didn't need to handle it the same way we did manually. And it turned out to be really good. So we went from it took the better part of a day, and now they just click two or three buttons, and it's all handled automatically. It's not fully automatic, but it's, we didn't automate everything. We just automated enough. So in 2013, the big boss comes down speaks with my boss, and he says, uh, uh, I bought this company in Norway. Uh, there's this uh, customer base of 30,000. Uh, we need to, um, we need that in our system. Uh, can you do it? And if we were doing Scrum or something like that, we would have said to him, oh, come back in 13 days. We're in the middle of a sprint here. And I, I, I don't think he, he would have liked that. He isn't that kind of guy. He's very pragmatic. So we said, OK, so when do you need it by? Well, if we, can, uh, if we can do it early, if we can do it by April, well, that will uh, that'll be nice. But if we can do it by March, we can make this much money. And we dropped everything else, switched tasks, and got on the Norway loan import. And we managed to, to do that. We, 
we did the sort of the, we used the, I remember this, we had this huge file with all the customers and we used that with our web API and did an import. So we sort of faked 30,000 new customers coming in on the web. It took us a, a while, but it, it's uh, used it sort of the, 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 the minimalistic approach. What is the least thing we can do to, to sort of, what is the, the minimum amount, amount of work we can do in order to get those customers into the system? I think that's a very pragmatic approach. So I don't remember if it was the same time or another time when the big boss comes down to, and speaks to my boss and he says, you've been working on this system for eight years now. When are you done? Uh, and he says, well, we can be done today. Oh, really? Yeah. If you don't change your mind, if no new laws passes, or if the customer stops using the system. We can be done today. <laughs> and, and, and then I think it's, it's by, that, by that time he realized that, and I usually say this, if getting software is like getting a baby, you're stuck with support for a lot longer time than you, you might think at first. You think it might be like, I don't know, five, 10 years, but it's more like 20 years. And, and finally, you get tired of it and they kick them out. I mean, the <laughs> things got better, though. In two, 2014, we moved in. So now we're sitting in the same space. I'm down here. And my, my boss, the product owner, the, uh, the, the main expert, he's on the far top right there. So I can just, I can see if he's busy. I can see if he's on the phone or if he, he's, he had his, has his head down. I can like walk over to him or like, okay, I see he's there now. So I can ask him that question. I can just walk over and, and it's very liberating. And he walks over a lot to us and asks us, oh, okay, so we're in the midst of uh, um, maybe changing this or we're, we're launching this and, or we're doing that. And, and we have a conversation about it. I remember it was less than three months ago, we had a conversation that I didn't know where, I didn't expect where it was going, but it, we ended up doing a pretty significant business decision in, over, in under like five minutes. I just walked over to him and was like, okay, we're, we're in the middle of doing this and uh, we could go this way or that way. If we go this way with the system, uh, we get a lot less complex system. But if you go, on the other hand, if you go this way, it gets a lot more complex. Oh, and he said like, okay, go with the, the, the simpler version. Oh, but that means that we'll handle this thing differently. Oh, and then he just said, okay, I'll, let me take care of that. And he like just knocked on the, his desk and said, okay, attention everyone, uh, we're changing this, which means that you have to do this and that instead of that. And everyone's like, okay, that was your training. So that's the, the kind of things you can do if you're sitting three meters apart instead of three blocks or three floors apart. We can do something in the morning. We can come up with an idea, deploy it in the afternoon, and we can, the training for that new feature takes 10 seconds. If it's, a, if it's a part of the system that people don't use that often, they won't remember it anyway. So if we do a major overhaul, it's like, oh, what, what? the system well it might have looked like this but I don't remember okay <coughs> let's go ahead so what we do as well is that we don't fit we fit the the business problem to the the current technical solution that we have in Finland I remember how we introduced savings um, they came over for a meeting to ask for new features in there. They were going into this partnership with a uh, travel agency where if you, if you save money with a travel agency, 
you get a uh, 10 or 15 percent deduction of your next purchase. So if you save like 6,000 euros, you get an additional 600 euros when you buy the, the trip. So they were in, in Finland, they were borrowing money from, uh, from some place. But if they, when they made it this, this partnership with the, uh, the travel agency or the, the traveling business, they get that money that people save for a future trip. And they can use that money to loan that to, for loans. So that they get cheaper money, so to speak. So banking is really about getting money in and paying some interest for that and lending money at a higher interest. It's not that complex. And the bigger the spread is between those, the more money you make. So now you know everything about banking. <laughs> so what we did with the Finns, they came over to Sweden and they asked, so you have this, you have saving accounts in Sweden, right? And we were expecting them to come with sort of a big list and maybe they had their sort of wish list. But we said to them, so this is what we have and maybe you can fit the business problem to our savings. And they worked out a way so they, they can do that. So we didn't make a single change in the, in the, in the code. We just added a, a way for Finns to open up Finnish accounts. And I, I find that that's truly minimalistic approach, and very pragmatic. And also seeing the whole, I think. So, in order for us to be very responsive with software development, I mean res respond to, to the business, we try to expand our sphere of influence. We want everything under our control. We want to control how we deploy to the server so we can roll back super fast. We also want to control how the, the invoices are printed so we can change stuff really fast so we're trying to sort of the develop the, the, the whole team is trying to expand the sphere of influence so we can be really quick to respond to the the customers or or if, if we want to do something with the report server other people they tend to go the in the other direction they tend to outsource stuff we want to sort of insource it, everything, keep it close to ourselves. The code, the deployment script that we're doing. We're even building the, the code with code. We don't have a, a I mean, a, we don't use Maven. It's too slow. We automate every, uh, a lot. We don't automate everything because we don't have time for that. We go like 90 percent and that's that what I that's what I mean with contiguous we we do something here and if we need to do more we we sort of keep doing a little bit more until we feel it's it's enough we don't the 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 continuous improvement we don't improve continuously on everything we we just we don't have time for that so we do the bare minimum but with the holistic mindset to see, okay, is this going to work in three months, three years as well? So if you remember in 2010, 2011, when we were sort of pushing to production, we said, let's schedule a date. In 2012, we said, okay, we'll use the lunch break. Now, 2013, we just scan the room and say, okay, can you pause for 30 seconds? We're pu pushing new stuff. Okay, I'll uh, check my Facebook or whatever. Okay, well, no need for that because it's uh, already there. Oh, okay. <laughs> and you see people go up to get some, uh, some coffee. Like, can, can, we pa can you pause for 30 seconds? Okay, I'll get some coffee. And they like go up, lock their workstation, like, okay, you can get back to work. 
well, you said 30 seconds. Oh, it might be 30 seconds, but it's closer to 10. So, there's this classic question, how do you eat an elephant? Well, you eat it piece by piece. Uh, you do, like, elephant carpaccio. Thin slices of elephant, each and every day. Elephant today, elephant tomorrow. We don't do that. We don't cut up the elephant in pieces. We use, a, we use our shrink o -matic and shrink the elephant, do a tiny, tiny piece, like a small, fully functional elephant, instead of something that's not functioning, like a piece of that elephant. There's this, I remember <coughs> when the product owner came to me and he said, we need this new, s new savings account. We need to be able to um, lock the money for 12 months and at a higher interest rate. And if you decide to withdraw money, you get a penalty fee. And after 12 months, when the, the, sort of the, the, the account, uh, when the time is up, it's supposed to be automatically transferred to your savings account. And we had a conversation, as, and, and usually when it comes to like, okay, when can this be done? I know they're going to ask me at, at, for a date, and I don't want to give them a date because to this day I haven't been able to like estimate anything, <laughs> really. <laughs> It's either like, oh, it's going to take three weeks and I'm done in three hours, or it's the other way around. And that pisses people off. <laughs> so I take, uh, when people ask me for an estimate, I take that as a, as a hint to probe more deeper and, and ask up to the point where, where they say, let's do it. So in this case, we had this new savings account. And... Um, and uh, he kept asking me, so how long it's going to take? And I said, OK, what, what if, if we do it that way? Can we, can we reduce the scope? Can we shrink the elephant? Can we make it really, really tiny, but still have some a very a useful elephant? And, <clears throat> and we, we were discussing back and forth, back and forth. And uh, we came to the conclusion that the, the most difficult part with uh, these accounts, new accounts, was, was the automated uh, termination of accounts. And I said, so I have this crazy idea. What if the account isn't terminated automatically? What if you have a list and terminate the account the usual way? And he said, oh, yeah, well, it might just work. You see when people like pause for like half a second, you know that you're well, this idea might have something to it. And he paused for like half a second and was like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, well, we can do that. And if, if it's, this account type gets really popular, then we have to like automate it. And I said, yeah, okay. And then he said like, yeah, let's go ahead. We do this. And we did. And I don't remember exactly how long it took, but we did it without the, uh, the automatic termination. And um, we ran that for more than a year like more than, like I think it was 18 months before we did the automat automatic termination. And it was like when the, the account managers, when they, they felt that, okay, though, this takes too long, then we auto automated it. We didn't know if, if it's going to be a success or not. So this is what our de uh, deployment planning looks like now. Very simple, right? Do we deploy Mondays? Yes. Wednesdays? Yes. Tuesdays? Yes. Fridays? Well, it depends on the time. I don't want to be called Friday at 8, like, oh, I screwed up again. No. Friday around noon. Do we deploy at 9 o'clock in the morning? Yes, we do. At 4 in the afternoon? Yeah, we do. At 6 in the afternoon? No, we don't because I don't want to be, be called. And if we screw up, we can reverse really fast. We can, we can use the, the control Z. So this is how we sit today. 
we have devs, customer service, credit managers, and the domain experts. This is how I can see three, six meters away. It's like, OK, so the domain expert, he's busy now. I might not want to disturb him. He looks pissed. Or, or rather, this one I, I really like. You can hear customer service talking to customers. And, and you can hear what kind of problems the customers are are having right at the moment like oh well maybe the system is slow or maybe there's this that or you can hear the the credit managers and account managers talking like oh wow well, it's this customer again oh wow or rather well this is this this new feature well I really like that it's so simple to use I, I just love that that's what I that's why I develop software in the first place I want to see how people use my the stuff that I work with so that the the result of my creative process being in the hands of real users. So being in the same space means that we have this, we can, we can pair, we can do mob programming, we can solve problems as a mob. We can, the domain expert can, can come up with an example and show us that in like under a minute. We do problem solving huddles, we don't do meetings that are over one hour, and we definitely don't do email ping pong. After the second email, that's a, that's a sign for me. It's like, I walk over to that person. It's, it's to, the, to the point that we do, some, some, we do have some business with uh, people on the, on the floor below us. And I've s sort of taken that up with them as well. When they send me email, I go down to them and, and talk to them. So it has influenced their style of working. They come up to us now. That never happened three years ago. So a uh, bit of a recap. Back in 2010, we had a 10-step build. Now we have a three-step deploy and a control Z strategy. Back in 2010, we sat three floors apart. Now we sit three meters apart. Huge impact on how we work. Makes it the MPH approach really possible. And this is what we sort of accomplished in those years, technically and uh, business-wise. And that's all I had. So, so I think we might have some time for questions. And, uh, or rather, I will be sticking around here. Yeah? Can you tell me a little bit more about your transition from ORM to JSQL? OK, yeah. O ORMs is uh, object relational mapping. And we're transitioning from that approach to SQL because it's slow. It's super slow. And it also has to do with the, uh, how we stored or not stored the balance. Now we have a transition to more SQL-based approach where we store transactions. Everything that happens ends up. So we know the balance all the time. But so is the question. How we're, tra how we're replacing ORM code or how we, why we're doing it, or is it both? Oh, I just work on a team that where everyone has a lot of problems with ORMs. Yeah. I was wondering what, what the final straw was and, and if you encountered any unexpected problems using straight SQL. No. No, not, not really problems. What happens, though, is that uh, the domain, you realize that uh, ORM objects, like uh, objects, to support the, the ORM, you think an account is an account at all times. So you bolt on everything to that account. And then you realize that, OK, maybe in this aspect, it's an account. But over here, it's, it's close to an account, but it's not the account. So now we have more than one account. And that sort of like teasing uh, domain language, rather teasing out um, domain concepts out in the code, it, it gets more uh, visible. So that I think that's, that's you're going to get up against, so is this an account or this is an account, or, or is, are they both accounts? Mm -hmm. So that gets more, uh, more visibility, and I think that's our biggest, biggest hurdle. It's not a technical issue, really. I mean, programmers, developers, you get beyond that pretty fast how to structure your um, 
your code or, or your SQL code and how to test that. But what, what's really the, the difficulty, for me at least, is, um, is the domain aspect of the whole. Was that sort of an answer? Yeah. yeah? Um, you talked a lot about how you did it. Yeah. And uh, I've worked with and developed with you. But there's some developers who are inherently purists. And mm -hmm. like, so in the course of the period that you have here, did you have any developers join and leave? Or was it the same team? And were there any purists? <laughs> so we were fortunate enough to have only people from my firm, the same firm, and we have a huge overlap in how we look at software development. But still, I think I'm the more, I'm sort of here on the pragmatic spectrum and, and a colleague of mine, he's here. Mm -hmm. But I think if we were to sort of compare us to I might be here and, and people, they were like down there. But still we have our different views. But we, no, we had, didn't have anyone leave, but I, I see how, how that could be a problem. Yeah. People, they want to they wanna gold plate the gold plate. Yeah. Well, even like the, the example of saying, you know, I want to use an ORM or I don't want to use an yeah. There are some people who just, they just refuse. Right. Like, yeah, so. This is, I don't know if this just a crazy idea that I have, but <clears throat> if you're discussing that, I see that as a prosthetic problem. You're discussing that because you can discuss that, but there's a deeper problem someplace else. Yes? So, so this, this model of minimalism, pragmatism, uh -huh. and holism, now, I, think, I think everyone wants to, mm. wants to get all three of those. Yeah. It seems like the challenge is, there's always going to be a trade-off, or there's, there's often going to be a trade-off, um, especially with minimalism and the other, the other minimalism and pragmatism. Yeah. So how, how, I guess, do you have any examples of how you've negotiated that trade-off? So I think <clears throat> what's really special about our situation is that the domain expert, he's, he's, he's seen a lot, and he... He is the sort of minim most minimalistic product owner, um, product champion that I've ever met. And he, he's the one who keeps championing that. Like, how can, what is the least possible thing we can get away with? And I think if you start that, if you start with a, a business um, perspective and, one, and you try to go for a really simple business model, uh, everything else gets a lot simpler. W well, the, the business proposition is loans and savings on the web. No special fancy stuff. So I think um, for us, we, we're fortunate enough to have a business person that knows how to prioritize and knows, well, so he knows how to say no to people that want to hear yes. He's really good at that. When the big boss comes down and he says, okay, you have to choose between those two. Like, <laughs> So he, he says no when everyone else says yes. And I think that's, that's my big lesson that I learned from him. So there's this book called The Power of a Positive No. If you're saying no to something, you're actually saying yes to something else. So prior to that no is a yes. And after that no is a maybe or yes, a later yes. So you have to see what, in order to say no more, more firm or more powerful, you, know, you do want to know what you're saying yes to. Question about... Uh challenges that you faced and how you overcame them about reaching that 30, 30 second deploy mm -hmm. time? Oh, well, it, was, it started with the, the pure build. So we know what we're putting out. And then it came, we were more confident in what we could do if we could roll back. That was the sort of the, the key thing. Can we roll back fast? 
then we know how to experiment. We, we dare ex do experiments if we know how to roll back fast. So uh, the key thing there was doing a bit of automation and then trying that out and then rolling back and doing automate a bit more and then a bit more and then a bit more and now we're almost sort of gone the whole way. I don't think with the pot, maybe we can we can automate a, a few more steps. It would be nice. It would be we're we're sort of aiming for a seamless deployment where we can upgrade and people that are using the old version they will keep using that until they log out. So they seamlessly. So if they go get a go for lunch, have to log back in. They're do, using the new version, and we're. <clears throat> that's our goal, but the the way to to where we are today is being able. I think the the, the key thing for us was being able to roll back. Are you also deploying the shrimp, the shrunk elephant? Yeah. Instead of like big. Yes. Of yeah. Board? Yeah. All the time. Sometimes we do what we call the um, feature toggling. Mm -hmm. You can toggle features on and off. So we we can have this new new way of doing things and if that doesn't work out we toggle it off we call that yeah feature toggling yes i'm just wondering if you have any advice um or words of wisdom for teams that don't work uh that close to each other and who are very very far apart and you're still trying to function as a cross-functional team and you could be like you know 16 hours apart and Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> well, <laughs> my advice would be move in with each other. I don't know. I would love to. Yeah. I'd love to. I, I, well, I, I think you have to work with what you got. Git. Are you using Git? Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> and Slack, which really helps. Oh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, if it's 16 hours apart, do you have three teams or two teams? Uh, we have one team. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But they're sort of in three different places or two different places? Or they're in, uh, they move. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I think, I think it helps if they really want to do what they're doing. I mean, if you're Everyone just... Everyone does. We're awake all night. Yeah. All of us. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think, yeah, you can make it work, but... Yes. Um, I was very interested in your point about the uh, locking and mm -hmm. how uh, you decided to go with conversations over yeah. more complex locking systems. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine the conversations center around scalability of that decision. Yeah. And so um, I, I work for mostly a hardware manufacturer. We have software products. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the conversation on the manufacturing floor is they don't do something unless it would scale by a factor of three. We were yeah. Producing three times as many instruments, uh, our systems have to handle. Them. Right. Yeah. So how does that fit into making that decision not to do the lock? I think the it was with the the, the sort of the, the the strategy of uh, of running the bank is is supposed to be small and very simple S loans and savings. A and if you have a really simple products, you don't need that many uh, credit managers and account managers, and then you can fit them in one room. So I think that's, that goes with the strategy. Keep the problem, problem domain small, and you can keep the product simple as well. So if you, if you remove complexity, I mean, complexity breeds complexity, right? But also simplifications make for other simplifications, and we're trying to keep the, the business problem very simple. So I think when you sort of 
when you said we wanted you you guys wanted to scale, but we don't want it to scale, so we don't have to. So if you put the locking in, you would, uh, feel free to hire more and more people because this is yeah, and, I, and suddenly you're much bigger than you wanted. To. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. When you arrive there, the walls are software stack in place. Yes. And you, you work on that. Yeah. Have you had the choice? Would you <coughs> software stack? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would that be? I think today I, I, I might have chosen um, uh, Scala or Clojure. Now it's Java and uh, help us all, JSF, which is Java server faces. You're still mature. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's uh, still, I, I, I would go with a a more powerful language. Yeah, I think that's the purest in me speaking. <laughs> Do you think you could have gotten away with Clojure and a banking environment? Maybe not. Maybe Scala. I think Scala, yeah. But still, they... There's this... Uh, it's not a banking environment, but they're, they went with Erlang. Yeah, and um, they, they scale their business though, and now they're having difficulties finding Erlang programmers, so they're switching to Java. Yeah, so I think you have to sort of ask yourself the question, do we want to scale the business so much so we want to change the technology stack? Or is it okay? to just be in our size, the, that sort of, that pond. Is that okay? Yeah, <laughs> they could. Mm -hmm. Could you have made your strangler thing in Scala? Yeah, a yeah. A Java trunk? Um, we were discussing that, but we, we took a sort of, I think, holistic approach and looked at it so, if we did that, maybe the since we're consulting with them, maybe we would have like sought off the the wrong branch yes. and made it impossible for them to hire in the future. Right. And also, you now have two different languages. You're yeah, with yeah. Minerals. It does. It does. Yeah. Maybe one language, but it's not the ideal language. Yeah, it's. It is. I think so. I I truly think so. And, and it's, you can see the idiomatic shifts, though, in the code base, where you go from doing for loops in this way and doing the more functional approach with a... And, and I don't like that either. I, I just want to... If, if it was possible, I'd like to like just take the code base and do some magic with it. Mm. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, so we're doing it this way now. Or we, we don't uh, return null from functions anymore. We, we do the null pattern or whatever. But that's not possible either. So, but I, but I think it's, it, you have a really valid point there. We want to keep, we want a, a minimalistic approach to the, to the language as well and how we do the, the concepts that we introduce in our code base. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I was curious about the point in there, level up with Git. Because yeah. um, I, I feel like I hear a lot of people these days talking about simplifying their Git yeah. workflow. Mm -hmm. And um, so I found it interesting with all the simplification, minimalization that <coughs> yeah. you talked about. Uh, I'm curious what level of Git you have to get. Um, I think that's on a purely um, how proficient we are with Git. After a while, we this did the more the, the super simple stuff, but after a while you, you, you get proficient enough with the, with the Git so, so you can, you have the power of doing something that, I don't know, you, you could do some, some merging. But, but still, we don't do super complex stuff with Git either. What we did, we have this, what do you call, I don't remember now. Um, it's an, it's an add-on where you do the, ah, it is, maybe it'll come to me, but, no, okay, 
So we just leveled up on the sort of the, the proficiency. We don't use advanced stuff in Git, not that much, but we, we do some if we really, really need to. Well, can I follow up on that? Can mm -hmm. you tell the story about how you were working on one thing? Yeah. And then the big boss came in and said, drop everything yes. and do this instead. That seems to me like a place where Thank Git you. versus subversion. <coughs> That's it. That's that's <laughs> it. Because we were working with subversion and we were able to task switch a lot faster. We just stash stuff and switch branch and that's super fast. And we work on the new new stuff and we finish that and then we go back again. So yes, that's it. Thank you. That's how we That would have been really hard with subversion. It, yeah. <laughs> and before so subversion you know if you know how to use the tool. Right. And before subversion, we had PVCS. Have you heard of that? No. Oh, okay. Well, if you hear it, just run in the opposite direction. <laughs> I'd much rather work with uh, zip files. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I mean, like fast feedback is the is a is a value from XP or, or one. It's it's feedback rather, and I'm a feedback junkie. I want super fast feedback. I want you know the squigglies. Uh, if something doesn't compile, you have the compiler. You have the um, unit tests, you have integration tests, you have feedback from everyone. Like if you, you, the faster feedback you can get, the quicker you can turn. So yeah, it's, it's a core, core thing. And does like, uh, in terms of like the amount of stuff that you guys are working on at once, that can shorten feedback cycles too. Yeah. So is, uh, you know, you talked about like mobbing and pairing. And yeah. I think you kind of alluded to kind of minimize, you know, just do something, make it small, make it quick. So yeah. did you? That's it. Well, we draw we draw a lot on. We don't have any like we don't have a process. We have a process, but it's not like we're doing this and that and this. But it, we we're heavily influenced with lean and XP. Yeah. Yes. Thanks very much.